Right, well, my name is um, Ashley Godsall, and I live in Ullinswick. Um, my age is 79, just had a birthday, uh, and I, f I feel great about it because I'm in good health, and I've got no ailments, and I'm really proud of my age, and I still do everything I always wanted to do. And when I look back on my career um, with Froome Valley Transport, Philip Bowler alert me to uh, load up pockets at uh, Davis's of Claston, and um, I must have picked it up pretty quick because um, Philip made a good job of learning me, and, and from there on in, I was on my own, uh, and I must uh, uh, um, appreciate his efforts in learning me because it's not easy to learn anyone. Uh, and yeah, we had to learn it pretty quick because there was such a lot of ups to haul. And um, Froome Valley Transport was, uh, I would say, was the, without a shadow of it, it was the biggest hauliers in Herefordshire for, for hauling our pockets. There was other other hauliers as well, but um, not on the scale that uh, Froome Valley Transport was. I started um, uh, with um, Froome Valley Transport. I, I left the services and um, I um, I drove all sorts of vehicles in the forces, uh, tanks and lorries and just about everything really. And I fancied uh, my chances at uh, all age work. So I went and saw uh, Froome Valley Transport and uh, Philip Bowler was the boss and he gave me a job. And um, I reckon I started with Philip uh, about 1961, must have been late 61. Tell me about um, Philip Bowler and the role he played. Yeah, well, um, uh, when I approached uh, Froome Valley Transport for a job, um, he said, come on in the office. So I went in the office and we talked about um, things in general and uh, licensing and all that. And... Um, he said, oh, well, you can, you can start here. So we, um, I think I started practically immediately. And um, I hadn't been there very long. I, I remember going on um, fertilizers, which in those days was all paper bags. And my hands was, was, was so soft. The, the hard paper bags was giving my hands a terrible time <laughs> and but one thing about it, Philip Bowler and and transport um, there was a lot of people there I think Phil told me a while ago there was 27 lorries there and um, I started life on Froome Valley with a Bedford lorry with a Perkins P6 and um, uh, he did um, general haulage and livestock hauling. Um, it, it was a wonderful place to work because there was such a variety of work. Uh, and of course, you, um, like when I went there, I, I had no experience in loading loads. And I remember sheeting a load of cans uh, that had to go to Hartley's and Madley. And I had no idea how to, how to put the sheets on. And the store was right opposite from Valley's yard. And I remember one of the men said, oh, you don't call that sheeting alone, do you? He said, the boss will take the name off the front of the lorry because he'll be ashamed. And then another man came along and said, don't worry about him. I'll give you a hand and show you how to sheet the load. I don't know where Philip was, probably on something else. But um, what I liked about from Valley, there was such a lot of variety of work. Uh, in those days, there was a lot of feed stuff, animal foods, to be delivered from Bivis of Worcester and BOCM at Avonmouth, uh, um, Wapping Mills in Bristol. It, it was a fantastic job in a way. And coming to the end of my time there, um, I was a bit sorry to leave, really. But we won't go into that. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, I, uh, uh, Philip said that uh, he wanted me to go on a hop all in. 
And he said, I will come with you and learn you how to put the hot pockets on the lorry. So as I previously said, I had to learn it quick. And Philip only showed me once. So whatever he told me must have been absolutely accurate because I, I didn't make any mistakes on my own. So as you well understand, I had to learn it quick and do it right. And there was no way I was having any hot pockets off the lorry on the road. So um, I've always had a great admiration for Philip Bowler for learning me as quick as I picked it up. And as I said before, if you're not shown properly, you can't do the job properly. That's lovely. I wonder, could you tell us that just again, but this time, could you tell us where he, where he was teaching you? Was it at the classroom? Probably? Oh, yeah, yeah. Could you tell us that? Yeah, um, Philip said, um, right, get that lorry going. And he said, I'll get, I'll be there within a minute or two. So I got the lorry ready and um, got all the ropes out of the store and the sheets. And um, uh, I waited in the lorry and then Philip came along and he said, right, we're going to Davis at Claxton now. And um, I said, you'd have to show me the way. I said, I, I don't know the name of the people, I don't know the farm. I said, well, don't worry about that. Um, so away we went on the Airford Road and then turned off left-handed and um, went down onto the um, Ledbury Airford Road at Stoke Eden, turned right, and Davis's class and was on the right. So we backed under the under the chute and uh, and started loading the pockets. And then Philip, Philip is handling the pockets, but showing me at the same time. And then as he he passed the pocket to me, then he watched how I how I positioned it on the lorry. So we kept doing that until the load was finished. And then slinging them. As well, he looked out a sling rope, uh, ops. He might have put him down a couple of three times to get it dead right. But once I got the hang of it, I got it pretty quick. And I have to say, I loved op hauling. It was something that I really did enjoy doing. And I think that if you're doing a job you really love doing, you're at your best. Pardon? Did you meet Peter Davis at Claston? I never met Peter Davis. No, I didn't. I knew who he was, but I didn't actually, we didn't actually see Peter Davis that day. So, and um, furthermore, when we got the load on the lorry, I can't remember where I delivered him to. I, th I think I'm right in saying I delivered him to um, Worcester, which was a council property. Um, on the Bromyard Road, as you come out of Worcester, it was about the last tall building on the right, on the right hand corner. And the building was very high. And I remember the man had a, a badge on here, Worcester Town Council. And, and he told me where to position the lorry, lovely fellow he was. And he said, you, um, you put the hooks in the pocket and then I'll, I'll pull a cord and then hoist the, hoist the pocket up in the air up onto the stage at the top and then another man or two will take the pocket off me and then I'll lower the rope down and so on until we finished. So what, and I'm pretty sure that's where I took them. What tools did you use to haul the hops? Well, that was a, that was a hop hook. Um, there were several types of those actually. Uh, one was like a toggle thing that went between these fingers with two small hooks like that and a, and a T-handle. I never liked those things. They always used to make me sore between the fingers. So um, one of the men on the firm by the name of Vic Adley, um, he was a masterpiece at all uh, He gave me an hook. And he said, you take care of that. He said, and it'll, it'll last you for life. Uh, and he said, but just remember what I said. You look after it. Said, right. <laughs> so, so I did look after it, and I polished it up. And then I had it galvanized at the end of the season. But Victor always used um, 
that toggle between the fingers. I never liked that. But Vic Adley could put, put 42 pockets on a four-wheeler lorry in 20 minutes. And, and, he, uh, and when he manoeuvred that pocket, as Philip Bowler would tell you, the tods was dead upright, and there was no need to look over the side to see how they were. When he handled the pocket and positioned it in the groove, it was right. And I, I, I could never work out how such a, a, a person as Vic, or any man really, could, could handle a pocket and put it in the groove like that, and it was dead right. Where I would have to look over the side to make sure mine were right. But eventually, you do get it right. <laughs> Fantastic. Lovely. Nice one. Yeah, lovely story. Yeah. Well, it, it's like everything else, see. The, the practice makes perfect, doesn't it? And um, what I admired about Vic Hadley, he made the loading of hops so easy... You, you you wondered how it how it could be so easy. I mean, I I done uh, I done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hot pockets all in. I loved the job, but I never grasped as quick as Vic Adley could handle hot pocket. Uh, like it was such an easy effort, no problem at all. Uh, I, and I admire anybody who could master a, a job in that way. Don't, don't matter what job, does it? <laughs> if you're a masterpiece at it, it's lovely to see. Piecework and try to make everything was piecework. The pockets were, didn't have as many hops in because they were... Oh yeah, yeah, uh, you're going back to um, David, uh, Alloyd Baroud as a dormant accord. Yeah, well I understood, um, Phil Bowler said to me, well you must have stop on that job now every day until the optician is finished. And it didn't take me long to learn that uh, they weren't pressing the pockets as good as they ought to be. Like Davis the class on the other side of the road uh, was doing a tip-top job with their pockets. And um, some of the finest hot pockets that I ever owned was at, at uh, Potter's at Stanford Court, uh, uh, Acton Beecham. And they were pressed by hand and they were very, very hard. But beautiful pockets to load on a lorry. Whereas dormant and court pockets weren't pressed hard enough, and the reason for that was they, they were on piecework uh, and getting good money for the number of op pockets they could produce per day. Hence, the pockets were soft instead of being pressed hard. <laughs> Such is life. <laughs> Philip said to me that I'd have to take him to the coal store at, at Birmingham. He said, uh, which is the old A38 off the M5. And uh, it was more or less a straight run straight into the bowling from there. And um, it was a huge store. And um, I had no problem parking. I mean, you'd think of the bowling today being a very, very busy shopping centre. But it was very busy in those days as well. And I was always grateful that um, when I arrived there with this heart of glory, uh, I'd have the room to park. So it was only a matter of, um, of pulling on the roadside, nip across the road into the building, and the boys would say, I'll ride all ass back it in here. Because uh, they knew me by name and... Um, uh, they were a real friendly gang, uh, and um, one of the most amusing things I ever had happen there was there was a car right in the way, and I couldn't. The way I tried to position the lorry into the building, I couldn't do it because this particular car was in the way. So I said to the chaps, "I said I got an idea. I said I'll unlock the trailer. I'll drive my tractor unit onto the side of the road. We'll put a rope." on the front of the lorry and on the back of the car and we'll pull it along the road out of the way. So we did this uh, and then I hooked the unit back to the trailer and um, we, were, we were nearly finished unloading and this chap comes storming in the building and said, hey, have you seen anybody, uh, and, do you see anybody handling my car? So we said, no. Oh boy, what's happening? And he said, well, it ain't where I put it. So somebody must have pulled it along or something. 
So he said, no, but we've been here. We never saw a thing. <laughs> so <laughs> he left quite angry. <laughs> And I told Philip Bower when we got back what, what we'd done, <laughs> and it amused him as well. <laughs> well, uh, Philip said to me, um, I want you to go and pick up a load of hops at uh, Charles's of Stocks, at, at um, opposite St. Thomas's. Mandeville. Mandeville, yeah. Can you just start that again? Yes, <laughs> sorry, Bill. No, that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, Philip said to me, uh, I want you to go and pick a load of hops up at Charles's Stocks and um, at Munderfield. And he said, it's a bit of a job to get in there. He said, because you'll have to sort of back in alongside the house and the lawn. So I said, well, where's the hops going to be then? He said, in the house. And I said, well, our pockets in the house. And he said, yes. Oh, I thought, God, Lord, whatever, sort of. So anyway, I, I got up there, and um, they were never married. It was a brother and sister. And then he tells me to back the lorry through the double gates, which is on the front of the house. And the lorry was on part of the lawn, and another wheel was on the on the gravel, on the drive, uh, the pathway. Well, anyway, we got up to about um, four layers, and um, there was a couple of people uh, pushing the pocket up the side of the load. So I was leaning over the side with, a, with a, the, the urine in the one hand and my hook in the other hand, pulling the pocket up like that. And then I, I said, right, oh, I got him. And then all of a sudden, they gave one mighty push, which I wasn't expecting, and it pushed me straight over the other side. I, had, I, I couldn't get out of the way. I mean, I didn't even know they were going to push. So I went backwards, straight over the side. I didn't even like falling off there. And I fell down into their rose bed. Uh, uh, um, dirt in, in the roses. Oh, they stuck in my hands and my face. And I was quite shaken up, actually. Um, it took me a bit of time to, um, I had to get back up in the lorry. There was no such thing as, you better get a chair and have a sit down, <laughs> none of that. There wasn't time. Uh, so I had to make a quick recovery and climb back up on the load. And I didn't feel right for a couple of three hours. Um, but I kept working on, and I think it was because I kept working on that you sort of come right. <laughs> but I never got that. But I had another near one too. Ken Watkins, uh, no longer with us, uh, him and I was waiting at the upmarketing board in, in Worcester, in Angel Place, Worcester. And um, the chaps in the store used to go on the pop of a lunchtime. And um, they had this great big hoist with a sizal rope, and there was a big ball, steel ball that brought the cord all the way off the reel at the top. And uh, Ken and I was on top of the load. And um, gosh, I never get it. All of a sudden, this huge weight come down and, and made a great big dent in the in the hot pocket. And it went straight down the side of my face like that. And uh, then chaps up in the top laughed. They thought it was funny, but I didn't think it was funny. I, I was, I can remember the blood drain on my face. My face went tight because I thought, well, that fat ball had hit me. I would have been stone dead. But Ken Watkins, being Ken, he, he was never backwarding before when it was some pretty odd words. And he, and he gave him some sort of a talk into. I never said a thing. But I think I was too shaken up, really. But I, I never forgot it because it could have killed me. But the one thing that did happen, they didn't do it again. They, they didn't get on the booze anymore. Do you want to tell us about the, what the different names are? For on, the, on the pockets, yeah. Uh, well, um, the hot pockets itself is made of Estrian sacking. And um, when the farms buy the pockets, they're already made. Uh, 
And then when you, the, the, the people in the opdrawing part of the op sections, um, the, you, 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 you'd be sleeping uh, during the day and, and sleeping a little bit at night, because all to do with the production of the ops when they were dried and you'd rather get awake and go up in the op room and, and get it, the, pick the airs up and take them out onto the stage into the op room and um, uh, other than that then you'd have a hour making the putting a, a bit a handful of hops in the corner of that pocket and then hold it tight like that and tie a string around uh, to, to make a ball in your hand to uh, able to, to handle the pocket. Right, well the hop pocket starts its life um, in the hop room where it comes off the cone being dried and then um, the press man um, got the pocket like that and he puts a steel ring over the neck of the pocket, folds the flaps down and then that goes down through the floor and the steel ring seals the pocket to the floor, to its proper base, which enables the press to come down then and do the first press. And um, when it, when the, the um, I didn't know exactly, I think it's eight presses to make a pocket, but everything depends on how much the shoveling goes into the pocket. Sometimes there's a lot, because it's supposed to be filled up each time. But when it's full, and that's the end of the, of the press, then they wind the wheel up, the pocket comes up like that, they take a steel ring off, and they got a little couple of hooks, it fastens next together like that, and they lower it down on a big sack in. And then the man in the bottom, takes hold of the pocket, puts it on a trestle, and starts the procedure of sewing it up. But when he starts, he makes the ure first, which is what you use as a handle to handle the pocket. So that that ure then stops on its whole life. And, uh, and the same with the tot at the bottom. Um, and really speaking, that's, that's the story of uh, producing a, a full hot pocket. Did you also go to and pick up pickers from Dudley? Oh, indeed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, Philip Bowler said to me one day, um, tomorrow he said, I want you to um, um, take the, the ramp off the back of the cattle box and we'll put a, we'll put a tailboard on the back and a, and a set of steps and I want to go to, go to uh, Wolverhampton then to pick up up pickers um, uh, to bring down to um, Pudges at the at the, um, the new house. No, uh, uh, John Pudges. Uh, up pickers. I was to deliver them right, right next to uh, the bottom from Zill. John, I think his name was John Pudge. Yeah. Farmer Pudge was in New House. Frog End. Frog End. The Frog End. Pudge is the Frog End. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can we just do that? Can we do that again? No, we'll do it again. Right, Ashley. Can you give us some sort of time period? Was it the 60s? 60s. Oh, uh, yeah. It'd be, um, it'd be, uh, or oh, it'd be um, around about 62. I would have said it was 62. Uh, so Philip Bowler said to me, um, well, why don't you go and fetch these op pickers uh, from Dudley and Wolverhampton, they had them from, uh, but another lorry would help on that job. And then we would go to pick these op pickers up at Wolverhampton and, and Dudley and um, we'd have a set of steps and they all knew we were going there to pick them up. So it was only a matter of pulling on the side of the street and they would come out with all this luggage because bear in mind, they was going to be stopping on a farm for three weeks at least. And there was always a lot of luggage. And um, uh, bear in mind, there was only a tailboard at the back. And they sit on the floor. There was nothing to sit on. Uh, they just sit on the floor. And, well, sit on their, their luggage, really. And then drive them down to um, the farms where they had to go. And... Um, we did that for a number of years, and the amusing thing about this was, um, they always used to like to stop at the 
a huge pub called the Stew Pony, uh, which was, um, oh, I forget the name of that place. But anyway, I had done it once before. And Philip Bowler said, if you want to watch the mine, I want you to stop this pub. Don't get stopping because he said, you'll never get far. So I, well, I kept on and on and on, so I did stop. When I got against the boss's wishes, I still stopped. And I thought, I'll get him, get out of it. I had a heck of a job. So I made up my mind, never again. So this next journey now, this is another year, I said, don't forget we're stopping the Super Bowl. I said, no, I said, this train goes straight through. And no, we're stopping the Super Bowl. I said, no, this train don't stop. I said, he goes straight through. So as I'm in the the uh, Stuponi, they're hammering the back of the cab and kicking the back of the cab, telling me to stop. And they're shouting for all they're worth, pull in at the Stuponi. And I, I shout back, no, I ain't stopping. I said, this train goes straight through. <laughs> so I kept going. When I got to the Frog End Farm, oh, the language, because uh, uh, I didn't stop. I didn't have a chance to have a drink, you see. And the trouble was, as Phil Bowler said, uh, you'll never get him out. You know, drink one point, then drink another point, and then they're out of the van. Then they'll be bad in the lorry. So I, I give him a heck of a ride. I, I went pretty fast. Uh, and, and then I had a big, serious talking to off the farm for giving him a rough ride. So Froome Valley didn't send me the next year. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Pudge, um, they, they reported me to Mr. Pudge uh, um, when I got there that I wouldn't stop at the Stew Pony and um, I'd driven so fast uh, they had a bad road. Some of them were, 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 were sick in the, in, the, in the back of the lorry and uh, I should be downright ashamed of myself and he'd be reporting me to Mr. Bowler. So I, uh, Mr. Bowler made sure I didn't go next year. <laughs> Well, um, my answer to that would be that um, uh, what a contrast from the s 60s of driving lorries up to today. Uh, I mean, there's such a huge and vast amount of changes that, uh, like, you get shot for doing what we did years and years ago. Uh, but it seemed to be at the time that was the only way to to get from people from A to B. I mean, it, it didn't only apply to hop picking, it applied to, to um, current picking, didn't it, Glad? Uh, um, all sorts of fruits and, and stuff on farms. You had to get people from A to B, uh, and the only way to do it, really, was, was uh, transport them in the lorries. Uh, I often had a smile and thought, well, if the, if the copper was following you and Sinna was driving with a load of people, they'd say, well, look, you're, you ain't safe on the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, before I went in the forces, um, my father used to draw hops for uh, Stan Parker at Burley Court Farm near Lempster, and um, Dad and my... Uh, younger brother, my elder brother rather, and, and another very good friend of mine uh, that um, was, was known as Tony Watkins, uh, formerly of Bromard Electrics. He, he came with us every year, so there was my dad, uh, myself and my brother Tracy, and Tony, and we would work as a team uh, drawing ops for Stan Parker. And uh, we lived as family. We, uh, Diane was a Stan's wife, and, and I understand she's alive and well. Stan, I think, has passed on. I only learned that the other day. Uh, but they were lovely people. They looked after us very well. And um, we had good accommodation in those days. Uh, as I said before, we sleep a bit in the afternoon, and. Um, a little bit at night, but not a lot at night, because you'd be working then, because the ops would be ready to come off after loading the, loading the green, 
the uh, the up room for drying and then I had the job I preferred to be down the bottom taking the pockets out of the sling putting them on the trestle the first job you've done really was after they lowered him down you put him straight onto the scales and weighed him and then you shouted the weight back up to my brother who was on the press and there was an electronic uh, device which was a big lever and uh, you told him the weight so if the weight if it was too heavy then the next pocket he, he, he pressed had to be a bit lighter and so on so, so sometimes it'd be too light uh, but he was pretty good on the press uh, and uh, that's another job you see you, a job you had to get used to but my father was a good guy he, he, he'd be standing there and say a bit more a bit more you know I write on and lift him back up and um, then father learned me how to um, how to weigh the pockets and then um, in the afternoon uh, he learned me to stitch them up and how to form the year and then once you form the year and you start stitching you cross stitching you see and, it, and when you finished it was smart and my dad didn't like it any all day when you were sewing a line like that if you put the needle there the needle needed to be on the same line there not not down your you know what i mean all over the place it had to be straight and tidy so when the job was finished, my father used to look and say, I've done a good job with that lad. Ash lad. He always called me Ash lad. And father was the sort of man that liked it right all the time. And my God, you had to do it right. But there comes a time when you, why are you going to be so particular? But you get to learn in your young age that father wants it right, so you just will be right. And then not so long, that you realise what a good job it is. Yeah, uh, father would take the pocket off me then, roll it along and leave it flat on the floor. Then he'd get the stenciling kit and uh, stencil the farmer's name and an address on the side of the pocket with this um, black letter or whatever it was. And um, make sure the number was on there as well. And then... Uh, He'd roll them along to my brother and Tony, and then they would sack them up straight in the store. And then when it came to uh, getting short of space, we used to have to, what they call, top them. So three or three, four of us would get the pockets in and lift them up and put them on the roll and roll them along the tops to, to make room for the other ones until the lorry came and took them all away. Was that the stencil bit? Yeah, it was, that was just after they'd been stenciled. Can you, t uh, can you just go back to the stencil bit? Because we didn't quite get that, because the phone went. Oh. And you had to do the paint on. Oh, yeah. And then touch it up by hand. Just yeah. Just well, that bit. Uh, yeah, well, when I finished uh, sewing the pocket up, uh, I said, right, oh, Dad, uh, right, oh, roll it on here. So roll it on there. And then Dad would get the stenciling kit and, and stencil it all up tidy and make sure the number was on there, etc. Then he'd roll it along then to my brother and Tony, and they would stack them up. I I um, I seldom ever done stenciling. My dad used to do that nearly all the time. And if you didn't press uh, hard on the brush, uh, and you didn't get the full um, satisfaction out of pressing the brush hard onto it, and when you took the stenciling kit off. Um, if, it, if it hadn't stenciled through properly, then you had to do that by hand. But when my father done it, you never had that problem. My father done hundreds and thousands of them, uh, so it was always right. But Dad always made sure he did that job. And I expect that's why um, it was always done right. <laughs> that's lovely. Perfect. Well done.